Okay, I think we're live. Yeah, so here, you can switch between this, right? And this will show, you can, right there, you can switch between the drawing. Right? And then don't mess with that stuff, but this stuff is worth. Okay. And then if you switch over to here, you can see our live stream data. Where can I see, oh, the chat in the side? The chat's on the side over here, but the chat is also over here. Oh. So you can do this and chat at the oh. same time. In fact, okay. we have one comment that says, let's do this. Oh, hell yeah. Are we live already? I've been here since last night. Yeah, <laughs> I've been here since last night too, trying to figure out how to make this work. Uh, can't wait. Cool. Yeah, it's live right now. Oh, awesome. It's, well, yeah. welcome. But I will say it didn't start itself. I had to push the, the button. Okay. But yeah. Hopefully it works. Okay, we're gonna right, get in get here. On yeah. Yeah. Ha ha. This is not. Okay. No, that's not. It's a different camera. Cool. Welcome everyone. Here's a drawing. This is actually a demo that I just shot. Like I just finished it maybe 20 minutes ago, and uh, it's for a head drawing class. Just in case anybody wants to know. And I don't know, I'll probably just talk about some stuff for a second, unless anybody has any specific questions, but you can see a number of things. Here's something I just shot for a 20 minute class, you know, for like a 20 minute figure class. And of course the head drawing. This is kind of a cool one. Big dude lifting his arms up. Anyway, if you take my classes, these are the kind of demos I do, just in case anybody was wondering. You know, some torso stuff. Got some torsos to go with the torso stuff. You know, I'm teaching a facial feature class right now, so we've got a whole bunch of stuff on noses. So far I've done noses and eyes, and I've got a film uh, lips and ears today actually after this live stream and uh, another head drawing more of these anyway basically what we're going to be drawing today is a male figure that's basically going to be same model as this but different pose but it is a pose that I actually drew so if you're in my 20 minute class you're going to see this repeat a little bit and uh, yeah hopefully that's okay So what I typically do is start, if I'm working from reference, right? There's a big difference between working from reference versus invention, you know, and trying to actually invent something. <clears throat> uh, the way that I teach is kind of a hybrid of both, is kind of the idea. And uh, it sort of helps bridge that gap a little bit between the two, you know, because there's a lot of methods out there from working from reference that don't necessarily lead into being able to invent figures necessarily. But, you know, hopefully we can come up with something that, that does that. And, uh, you know, hopefully if you study this stuff long enough this way, then you'll kind of train your brain to start figuring out how to put these things together without any reference. Kind of the idea. Shrink this a little bit, make sure this fits on screen. So what I've done is I've marked where I want the very top of the image and where I want the bottom of the image. And this is going to be, I mean, it's a male figure, but he's doing like a, like a karate kick type stance. You can see the reference actually, maybe you saw it real quick at the beginning, but Olivia has to push the button so you can see it. And, uh,
fine. I just wanted people to see it real quick. And then, so we get top, bottom, and then I'll typically pick the halfway point. And what this does is it just gives us some key uh, points to help us orient the figure on the page while simultaneously just kind of getting something down on the page in the first place. Because a lot of the time, especially if you're newer, like the hardest part of drawing can be just getting started and like what's the first marks that you make and how do you make them in a way that where you're, you know, setting yourself up for a successful drawing. And that's tough. And that's kind of what this process does a little bit. Yes, it helps get the figure placed, but it also just gets some stuff on the page to help you start. Okay, so let's see, we got top, bottom, we've got a halfway point. I'm gonna lean over here to my laptop real quick where I have my reference photo. And I'm gonna actually measure on the computer screen where the halfway point is, which is a little bit below the knee that's kind of coming towards us. Just below it, maybe. Yeah, and then I'm gonna count how many heads down to that space, or that point, which would be one, two, three and a half, maybe, I think. Double check real quick. One, two, three. Now, I would say it's three to like about here, roughly, something like that. Right, so then we just find this space, break that into thirds, or just find what a third of it is. Again, I'm just taking my best guess and then measuring and checking and making sure this works, right? So we've got one, two, three, it needs to be just a little bit bigger. All right, one, two, three, that seems pretty good. So that gives us a head size. Uh, now, in this case, the head's not in the center of the pose. It's way off to the side. You know, so we have to take that into consideration because his legs also come way out over to this side. So we've got to sit here and think like, well, we've got to place the head strategically. There's a number of ways we could do that. If we need to, we can actually come in here and find the halfway point from side to side and then figure out where the halfway point is on him and kind of help that figure out where the head's going to go. I'm just going to say... I'm just going to move it over a little bit, right? Like if the halfway point is probably roughly the back of his leg, maybe. Oh, no, it might be way before that. Just kind of measure it again real quick. Halfway point is roughly kind of like where the inside of his fingers are, right? So he's got like one hand doing this, like kind of coming towards you. And where these fingers are dropped down, that's about, I guess you'd have to be able to see the reference to know what I'm talking about. Um, let's see, so that's our halfway point. The head's gonna sit, I'm just gonna just move it over to about here and say, okay, our head's gonna sit roughly here. It's at a bit of an angle, right? Head's tilted and going to sit right about here. I think that should be good. So that leaves room for his arm over here. It's tough. I don't know. It's possible there won't be quite enough room for this foot, but I think there will be, right? Because there's basically a big angle that his torso is going to follow, like across this way. And then we'll have the leg and foot over here, kind of like over this way. That's pretty long. I feel like that's going to be enough space. So let's get back to where we were. So again, when dealing with reference, right? Uh, not necessarily invention. Invention I would handle a bit differently. Uh, but, you know, when working from reference, I'm going to start with these measurements and then go into the head, neck, and shoulder section, right? And get the head, neck, and shoulders kind of locked in place and then sort of build off of those and work our way down. 
So this is going to we'll have some of the neck back here. And we're getting a little bit of neck down here. Let me zoom in here real quick. There we go. Right, a little bit of neck down here as well. And from there we have the shoulder, but the shoulder is really high up, right? So we have some tools to help us with this. And we have plumb lines, negative shapes, and angles, right? All three of those are critical, especially when you're working from reference, because that's where, you know, they're basically tools to help us analyze the reference and then make sure that what's happening in the reference is also happening in our drawing, right? So a plumb line is checking in the reference what's either directly above or below something, you know, either horizontal or, horizontal or vertical line to check an alignment with something else, and then making sure that same relationship exists in our drawing, right? So I can see right here already, I was about to say, ah, shoulder goes about here, but it doesn't, right? The very bottom of the shoulder section kind of aligns almost with his mouth, right? So if his mouth is probably around here somewhere, that means the bottom of the shoulder needs to be here, which means the actual shoulder itself needs to sit more like way up here, right? It's gonna be like up here somewhere. It's basically bumping right up against his jaw. Probably use a better head shape here. I started with an oval, but I don't know, I wasn't quite cutting it, so I think we could use something better. You know, this is what the head drawing classes are for. To get really, really familiar with drawing head shapes. When you got to draw one, you know, it's relatively accurate in a, in a quick way. Okay, so then we have the jaw kind of sitting forward a little bit, the ear kind of back up in here, and a little bit of the neck showing right here. And that's where we see the shoulder right in here, right? Comes out there, wraps up this direction, and over. All right, we get a little bit of neck down here. I see a little bit of collarbone, and then his chest. Oops, not quite that much of an angle. Starts kind of coming down this way. Now, that's basically it for our head, neck, and shoulder section, right? There's not much more to it than that. Because his, it's so far shortened, like his chest is up really high, his shoulder is up really high. You know, we're not seeing the trapezius, we're not seeing much of the neck, we're not seeing much of the collarbone. Now, what we're going to do once we get that head, neck, and shoulder section established is come in here and start trying to get a nice, strong gesture for the rest of the figure, right? Which is basically... Coming around this way. Sort of like that. Now remember our plumb lines, I'm gonna check. Where does that line end in relation to what's directly above? Draw a line straight down. That seems about right. Okay, uh, I know that this arm is coming out this way. Sure, it might be a little big, but arm's coming out this way and sitting Up under here. Right? And then this hand is like 
here and it's really big and kind of an awkward hand to draw but we'll talk about that in a minute for now we just need a placeholder right so i'm just throwing a circle in there and just saying hand goes there and that's it that's enough for now uh, so to deal with this foreshortening we have to remember So this knee is going to be here, which means the leg itself is going to come out this direction. And we're going to have a little bit of an overlap here, right? The overlap is one of our tools for showing depth, right? Showing what's in front of what. And overlap helps us do that. So anytime something overlaps something else, Right? We've got to really be <coughs> conscious of how that's happening. Right? So this leg then is going to sit over here right? and come out here to this foot, out this direction, which means the top of the leg is basically in here. It's a very simplified version of it, but... Going to sit somewhere right around there and that automatically tells me kind of where the glutes are going to go right so the glutes are going to sit back underneath the fingers out here maybe it's hard to tell exactly how far out there they are I'm trying to think if there's something else i could use to align that Right, we're going to have back of the torso up here, this part coming out this way. And then it wraps around back like that. All right, and this leg, remember, is kind of doing this. All right, we get this hip kind of wrapping around. Now, knowing anatomy is, is critical. I mean, there's, you know, if I'm being honest, like there's no way to do this at a really high level without knowing it. You can get pretty good without knowing it. Like there's a lot of good artists out there that, you know, they probably don't spend all their time studying anatomy because it's not totally necessary. But it just depends on your goals a little bit, I guess. So it's starting to look kind of cool, right? So we can follow this gesture down and... Uh, See if we can get this leg on here, right? It's kind of coming down this way. So I want this to end a little more abruptly. There we go. Yeah. There are a few questions, and one of them I think is this is probably a good time to bring it up. Okay. So Mark Watson asks, my question is about starting the drawings from life from a model. For a three-hour pose, would you recommend starting it by finding the top, bottom, and middle, and then the head size like you showed? Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you guys can hear Olivia or not, because we're using a different microphone this time. But she's basically, the question was like about uh, how to start a figure drawing. You said from a model or a photo? From a live model. Live model? From yeah. a live model that's going to be like a three-hour pose. Answer is, I would do it the exact same way that I'm doing it here. I mean, uh, part of the reason we do the 20 minute thing, and this is gonna take way longer because I'm gonna be talking about a lot of stuff, uh, but part of the reason for that is because we wanna get through the whole lay-in process, right? Like all the construction, the gesture, the structure, uh, even the mapping, maybe, maybe even have it all the way filled into a two value level within that first 20 minutes and then the rest of that three hour period for drawing from a model you'd be using for like uh rendering like really really careful slow rendering you know because rendering is hard and it takes a long time and if you spend a bunch of time just on the construction then you're not gonna have a lot of time left to render you know so it's really about uh yeah like basically this would be the exact same way that i would start a, uh, 
uh, like a longer figure drawing. Just another question yeah. for you that came a little earlier. Yeah. It says, hi, I'm looking at your courses and my hesitancy relates to the need to set up an easel and specific paper slash tools. How does the drawing biomechanics of this course translate to digital drawing? Oh, so again, I'm not sure if you guys can hear Olivia. You should maybe let us know because in my old job, whenever we did live streams, like with the microphone they had, they couldn't hear the person telling me the question. But I will repeat it just in case. Uh, the question was, they were asking like about kind of the materials that we use and, um, you know, whether or not this translates to digital. And it translates pretty well. In fact, I have... A lot of students, I don't know about a lot, but there's at least like a few each term that work digitally and turn their stuff in digitally. You don't have to use the same uh, stuff that you see me use, right? You don't have to necessarily get smooth newsprint and charcoal. I would recommend it, but you don't have to, right? Like there's a lot of places in the world where it's not even available and you can't even get it really. And so, you know, those people, they work either like in graphite or they work with... Um, uh, digitally, right? And so then at that point, you just save your drawing or painting or whatever you're doing and then just upload it like you do a photo of a drawing. And then I critique it the exact same way I do the other drawings, right? So I'll actually print your drawing out. Uh, even though it was digital, I'll print it out. I'll tape it up. I'll put tracing paper on top of it and I'll do a regular uh, critique for it. You know, if you're taking a gold level class and then... Um, from there, you basically have to figure out how to translate that into digital, which can be a little bit challenging. But once you start figuring out how to do that and how to create those edges and stuff, it becomes literally the exact same thing as working traditionally and in this way. And like all the same concepts, right? Shape, value, and edge work the same in every medium, right? Whether you're dealing with a soft edge, a hard edge, a firm edge, crisp edge, whether you're dealing with light or dark values, whether you're, you know, all that stuff, right? Shape design works the same, whether you're painting, whether you're um, working digitally, whether you're doing gouache, whether you're, I don't know, watercolor, whatever. It's all, it all works the same way, ultimately. You know, the problem, and I'm not gonna say it's all like totally flawless in terms of teaching digital people, because the problem that I hit is a lot of them kind of they'll occasionally ask specific questions like, hey, how do I get my digital brush to do this specific thing? And to be honest, I don't really work digitally. So that's the part that I can't help with a whole lot. I can tell you what result you need to be going for. And the answer is the same. Again, regardless of whether you're working traditionally or digitally, but how exactly to achieve that? Like what series of buttons do you push that makes that happen? I don't really know, but I've been thinking about buying an iPad for that reason. because so I have more and more students doing digital stuff all the time. And uh, I figure I should at least probably learn some Procreate or something. I don't really like working digitally, personally, but there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, when it's done well, it looks awesome. I'm, I don't mean that in like a critical way at all. It's just personal preference. There's something about drawing manually that I like. Just like it more. Okay, so we've got our gesture down, right? So we've got kind of a strong gesture. You can see, if you look at the reference real quick, if Olivia pushes the reference button. And then if we remove the chair, it's more like an actual kick, you know? So I just took the chair out. Uh, so we get our gesture down, right? Next stage is structure, right? So we go gesture, structure, and then um, kind of anatomy and lighting together at the same time, I would say, depending on how far you want to take it. I separate those as because I'm teaching it a lot, but you can kind of do those both at the same time. Okay, so let's take a look over here, right? What is <clears throat> structure? Structure is taking this like kind of two-dimensional gesture, you know, where we created some interesting stuff going on here. Hang on, I'm gonna add this calf on here. It's a little bit odd without it. There we go, that seems a little better. 
right? And so now we need to add structure to the gesture, right? So rather than just looking kind of flat, like outline-y type look, we're gonna go in here and figure out how to turn these into three-dimensional forms, right? That's our goal. What is going on here three-dimensionally? And we're gonna do that with blocks and cylinders. There's also spheres and cones and stuff, but to be honest, blocks and cylinders are most of what I use. That's really kind of the important part, right? So we start figuring out uh, this arm, right? It's actually a cylinder and it's coming towards us. And it's gonna lock up into here. Kind of like this, right? And so we're literally thinking of this as like a cylinder, right? Like it's actually a cylinder kind of coming back towards us. You know, that's why you have to get really, really familiar with drawing basic shapes. I mean, it's absolutely critical. You can't just draw a nice solid cylinder, which is hard, right? Because to do that, you got to draw basically a perfect oval or ellipse, however you want to think of it, right? So if you can't draw a nice, clean, even oval, it's going to be tough, right? Or a circle. This isn't the most perfect circle, but I think you get the idea. Yeah. Announcement. Yeah, announcement? Yes. Okay. This is really helpful. So Megan says that when we switch to the view with the reference, yeah. there's no sound from the mic. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That's good. I appreciate you letting us know because I didn't think to set that up. But I'll keep that in mind. If we show the reference again, it was, if there's no sound there, then uh, I just won't say anything. We'll just show it real quick and then I'll talk when we switch it back. We might be able to fix that. For you guys future. won't. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's just something you have to set up in, in OBS. Um, there's another question, but just let me know when you're ready. I'm ready now. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, this is, first of all, the person, YXXY, who asked about the digital drawing and traditional yeah. drawing. Yeah. Uh, they said thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And there's another question from Bruno, who asks, when you were a student at WASP Atelier, yeah. how many hours a day did you study drawing? Okay, so... Somebody asked, when I was a student at Watts, how many hours a day did I study drawing or spend drawing? And uh, a lot. I was, I was in a pretty fortunate situation where I was able to just basically stop what I was doing and just go to Watts full time. And I was able to take like a lot of classes, like eight classes at a time. And I did that for a few years. And it worked out where, you know, we basically had, or I basically had class every day throughout that time, right? Like almost seven days a week, maybe six days a week. And I would be at the school for like two, sometimes three classes in a day. Each class is like three hours. So I would say I was drawing anywhere from three to nine hours a day, but if you want to count actual drawing time, that's kind of tough because each class is three hours, but then there's breaks throughout the whole thing. And like, I don't know, but you got to take breaks. I mean, that's, you got to count that as part of it, I think. And then, um, yeah, so it was a lot, you know, and then you do like a 10 week chunk back then the classes were 10 weeks long. Uh, so you do like a 10 week chunk and then they would have a four week break and then another 10 week chunk and do that throughout the year. And I'd take just as many classes as I could each time. And to me, it had a lot to do with developing better habits. Because to be honest, I didn't, I liked drawing, but like, I wasn't motivated to just force myself to draw all the time uh, on my own, right? It just wasn't happening. I wanted to, but for whatever reason, it wasn't happening. So I, taking those classes helped me kind of develop uh the discipline really to actually draw all the time, right? Cause suddenly you're paying for a class and you want to get your money's worth. So you show up and then it makes you draw, right? Cause once you're there, you're going to do it. And uh, from there, you know, after a few years of that, you're drawing every day and then it just kind of becomes habit. And then you don't have to worry about it much anymore. And now I draw all the time. 
but thanks in part to those classes. So the answer was I drew a lot. Right, so we're seeing that shoulder from kind of a crazy angle. You know, we're just seeing a little bit of it and it's kind of wrapping up over the arm here. And then from there, right, we see the chest connecting across, remember, because the pectoralis inserts up over the bicep here. So we've got to figure out how to get that to read. Although I probably shouldn't be getting into anatomy yet. Chest kind of sits up here. Uh, let's think, hang on, let's not get into anatomy yet. It's too soon. We'll talk more about structure. All right, so remember, we're dealing with uh, a couple things. One, the hip. I usually use a box for the hip, but to be honest, with the leg up, you can't see most of that. So there's not really any major reason to go in there and find it. But the chest does connect in a very specific way that rhythmically kind of aligns with where the shoulder blade is back here. And you can kind of see that we can build this cylindrical shape with that rhythm and start figuring out exactly how the torso exists in three-dimensional space, right? And start figuring out like, oh, okay, we're gonna have the waist, you know, or this part kind of wrap it around here. I don't really like this line. I'm gonna try this again. That seems better, right? And then we get kind of this boxy shape out here, but again, not really seeing that much of it. You know, and then we get kind of like a cylindrical form for the leg coming towards us, right? So it's going to be wrapping this way. Right, about like that. Remember, this is literally a cylinder coming like right at us. Coming like this way. You know, it's basically sitting like that. So you can see what I'm talking about, right? You have to be so clear and confident with these shapes, right? Whether you're drawing boxes, cylinders, you know, you should be able to just draw a nice clean box at any time, right? That has like a very specific look to it and does exactly what you want it to do. You know, and this comes from drawing countless boxes, right? We get a box. I don't know why I made you just watch me draw a box, but hopefully that'll make sense. Okay, this leg I think is kind of going away from us a little bit. Is I feel like it's kind of pulled back, so I'm just gonna say this kind of wraps this way just like a little bit. Same thing up here, right? We get the ankle. the bottom of the bone here, the other ankle kind of sitting out here, leg wrapping back that way, right? And then we'll find kind of the adjust this. I kind of like this as the outer part of the torso and then this is more like a center line. I think that makes sense. You know, and then we're looking at the lower leg, right? What are we seeing down here? Well, it's basically, we're looking down at it is really what it comes down to. And the farther we go down, the more we're looking down at it, right? So here, I get kind of like a subtle curve, right? Here it gets a little more curvy, right? Here we're actually looking down at it like quite a bit. 
and here quite a lot, right? So you can see how each one curves like a little bit more. This one might be a little bit too much, but whatever, it looks fine. Um, you know, so really taking into consideration the idea that as things get farther away, right? And I don't, I'm not gonna get into like perspective and why this is exactly, but what you'll notice is anytime you draw like a cylinder, you're like, here's my cylinder. Right? The back part back here, this back part is gonna be more open than this part. Right? This part's gonna be a more narrow ellipse. This part back here is gonna be a wider, more open ellipse. Right? And then this part, of course, gets erased back out because we want it going this direction because this is the back. And so what you'll notice is now what we end up with is this part is more rounded than this part. Right? And so you can see that in all these little cylinders I made. Right, like I tried to round this a little bit more than this, right? Like this one, I tried to make a little more rounded than this one, you know? And studying perspective will explain exactly why. I mean, I teach a perspective class maybe once a year or so. But they're a lot of work. Uh, from here, I would go in and maybe start working on anatomy a little bit or get some better hand shapes. I mean, those aren't the best hands and I'm not gonna go like a lot into hands today, but we can do a little better than this. All right, it's kind of making this fist shape up here. And all I'm doing is just finding the shape, right? And just making like kind of simplifying it a little bit. And trying to it look a little bit more interesting and we get a little bit of thumb kind of poking out that way a little bit uh, this one this is the tough one right so this is not an easy hand so the wrist is like up here right and again, I'm not going to spend too much time on hands because actually I'm teaching a hands class next term. So if you really want to know, that's going to be the place I do it and teach all the hand stuff. But hands, I don't know. I'm not, I'll be honest, like I'm not the fastest hand drawer. I'm good at explaining it, good at teaching it. I don't know, drawing hands are complicated. All right, this is kind of wrapping up, coming towards us here. Right, notice I'm kind of developing this into like a 3D form a little bit. Right, kind of coming out towards this. It's like a boxy shape, right? It's just like a fancy box, but pointed right at us. Thumbs kind of coming out this way. Right, fingers are dropping off this direction. Cutting around this way. Around that way. This one, oh, for some reason, I don't know, I should have zoomed in on this. For some reason I was thinking there was two fingers coming at us, or, or, and two here, but that's not the case. There's actually three here. There we go. That makes a little more sense. And then this one is the one coming right at us here. It's actually kind of going up, over, back down. that way but again I'm not gonna spend too much time on hands here uh, then we're seeing a little bit of his forearm right actually kind of dipping down underneath here 
And then we're actually seeing more of his arm. This arm shape that I put in here, I don't think it was quite big enough. Right? Or I drew this hand too big. That's the other option. In fact, that might be the case. We'll drop that arm a little bit anyway, just so we can make it all line up. Okay, so also got a little bit of forearm sticking out over here. Always looking for rhythms, right? Rhythms are marks that we use to align two different things, right? Like two different parts of the drawing. And uh, in this case, right, I was using this curve here to align this part of the forearm and this part of the forearm. And then the way rhythms work is this part gets erased back out. But now this part and this part are kind of still rhythmically connected and it kind of helps our eye move throughout the drawing, right? And so you can see all over the place, I was kind of using that in terms of connecting the knee down through the ankle, you know, the, the shin all the way down. And so the end result, it was we kind of get something like this, where we'll say, here's our rhythm, you know, and then this middle part gets erased back out and this becomes, I don't know, whatever, something else, part of the brow or something it looks like it could be, you know, or like the shin. In this case is doing this, you know, the knees probably like up here, shin drops down and then we have maybe like the tibialis or something disrupting this middle part. This maybe gets a race back out, but now this part and this part down here are still rhythmically aligned, right? So even though we have this muscle here, our eye still kind of goes from here to here really easily, you know, so that's kind of the idea with rhythms rhythms and how and when to use them. I don't know, enough of that hand. Let's see, let's get into this torso just a little bit here. So at this point, right, we, we got our structure down and now we're getting more into anatomy right and figuring out what anatomy do we need what do we not need right we got some decent hand shapes we've got good three-dimensional forms you know it looks like a, a solid three-dimensional object now we can see that we have some of the shoulder blade right kind of popping out back here and connecting here and then we get rib cage coming out from under there. Again, being really careful with our overlaps, right? Overlap is critical. Overlap shows depth, you know, depth and, I guess it should be a little bigger, depth and, uh, you know, what's passing in front of something else. You know, so the chest, let's see, the chest is gonna come down and back in. It's kind of coming down this way. And notice it's basically following this rhythm that I made, which at the time I didn't call it a rhythm, but we can use it as one. This is not, this was just like a structural component, but it also works as a rhythm. All right, a little bit of the chest over here. All right, connecting right into where our structural slash rhythmical component sits. From here we have the abs kind of coming in a little bit and then swinging around this way. All right, so we've got to think about some more overlaps and trying to figure out how to get all this stuff to read as though it's, you know, relatively foreshortened. Which basically means being really careful with our overlaps again, 
right? So we have like a little bit of rib cage here. We're seeing some of the ab overlap here. Drop down this way, we get kind of that middle section. And this bottom section popping out like that. This seems a little too, I don't know, a little bit too much the same, right? It's just three equal bumps, so that's not good, right? It's a decent first attempt, but we have to recognize when something, right? Anytime we draw something, we want variety in our shapes, in our line work, right? So if we end up with something that's too much the same like that, it's, you know, it's not gonna work out super well. Uh, I'm gonna find, real quick, I'm just gonna say, let's find a general sweep here for our abs. Rather than just going for it, I'm gonna design it out a little bit. Say, okay, our abs are kind of cutting across this way. This is gonna be the bottom of the top ab. Right, cuts across, and then we hit the oblique. Right, oblique's kind of doing this type of shape. Right, so I'm basically creating almost like a little wireframe. Right, almost like I'm doing like 3D modeling or something. Right, and looking for that wireframe, and that's going to help guide exactly what's going on here. He's also, I'm sure, activating probably the far side of his abs more than make this one bigger. smaller that's going to come out like that so notice i'm mixing it up partly based off of what i'm seeing in the reference because it wasn't like three even bumps in the reference like that doesn't happen all that often uh, but we've got basically the top section middle section which is going to be up under here and then the bottom section all right and so we know the oblique coming up this direction rib shape and then we just got to come in here and design this out just incredibly carefully all right see if we can figure out how to get this section right so we get some rib cage kind of popping out across here down this way Abs here, and then up and around here, right? And then we get the next one here. This is tough. Okay, so this section then, we're going to have belly button. Abs coming out, kind of back up this way. That little middle section of abs is really narrow on everybody. I mean, it's not just him, but like there's like basically a big section and then like a little narrow section and then like a really big section. You know, so that's kind of what we're trying to design there a little bit. You know, and then remember, his abs have a thickness to it. Notice I'm designing them as like a little boxy shape. Again, getting into basic shapes, right? His abs are like, literally like a little box that we sat on there and then broke into those little segments. You know, and the boxy shape is what helps guide where those segments go, right? Because we've got to be really familiar with that. And that's how we get the foreshortening correct, how we get, you know, all of that stuff. Uh, let's see here. Oh, great trochanter, right? So we're going to have the, you know, the part of the, your hip, like the end of the femur, the head of the femur, I guess I should say, that sticks out right there. That's a good landmark to know because a lot of things connect to it and wrap around it, right? And then we're going to use our anatomy now to create those overlaps that I keep talking about. So we're going to have gluteus medius. 
up in here. And then Maximus kind of coming out from behind it. This way. Right, we get like a really specific series of overlaps that occurs there. And if you're not familiar with the anatomy, you're going to be stuck just looking at the reference going like, eh, it kind of does this. I think this overlaps that and it doesn't work real well, you know, because you want like an invented aspect to your drawings if you can. You know, from here we have rectus femoris kind of sticking out here. Well, lateralis here, right? Rectus femoris kind of out this way. Oh, that wasn't a good line. I'm gonna try that again. They don't always work well. It's not bad, right? And then we kind of come out here, hit some of gluteus medius, right? Which is another big uh, leg muscle on the inside, kind of down by the knee. And then we're gonna have some bone sticking out here, right? So we're gonna have some straights, right? The balance of curves and straights in your drawing, also really important. And something I've been meaning to talk about more, so I'm glad I remembered. But notice, most of what we have up here is a pretty solid mix of curves and straights, right? And where I'm trying to put the straights are like in the bony areas, right? Like I'm pushing some here in the wrist, right? The ulna right here, straight, right? Because the ulna is a very straight bone, goes from your elbow out to the outside of your wrist. And uh, you have to, I don't know, be able to use that to your advantage, right? Because you want to push straights in your drawing very strategically. And if you're you know, not super familiar with the anatomy, then you're not gonna be able to use that as a guide as to where you should be doing, you know, pushing those straights versus curves. And from here we have the calf. Poking out around this way and then kind of getting compressed up into this area. Calf and then well, a little bit of, that's probably gastrocnemius being pushed out here. Usually on the side of the leg, we would have the peroneus, right? So we have the head of the fibula right about here, roughly. Fibula is a very straight bone, right? So we could have pushed another straight in here. In fact, that's a good way to construct the lower leg because then that tells you if this subtle curve that you put in for the tibia is working, right? If you put this curve in, and then you realize like, oh wait, there's no room for the straight, for the fibula, because the fibula is really straight, then your leg is broken, right? So I mean, drawing both those lines can be really helpful. You get maybe a little bit of the soleus or something down here. Calf, anyway, what I was meant to say was the peroneus, right? Peroneus longus kind of attaches to the outside of the leg up here. Usually from this angle, that's what we would be seeing, but since there's all this compression between the top of the leg and the lower leg, I think it's actually pushing some of the gastrocnemius out over top of the peroneus right here. And that's kind of what we're seeing with this little extra bump on there. Right, on this side though, we get much more gastrocnemius. Right, up under here. And then the soleus up under here, and then bone, which leads down to ankles, which I'm gonna make a little bit bigger. All right, kind of sitting down around there. Uh, the ankle is the the malleolus, if you want the technical term. Malleolus sounds kind of cool, but for some reason I always just call it ankle. You know, see if we can get this foot shape on here. So we're seeing a little bit of the heel, just ever so slightly, a little bit of heel shape. 
kind of poke it out here. Right, and then we kind of have this part. Swoop them more around that way. Right, this part kind of comes out here, hit kind of this part, the bone sticking out. Remember, it's basically a wedge type shape. We're kind of seeing like this type of thing going on. You know, and then those toes are going to sit like out here. Little toe. Big toe. I'm not going to draw the toes right now. It's going to take too long. But the basically the knuckle part is like here. And the toes are going to sit out here. I'm teaching hands next term, if anybody's interested in hands. And then feet will be the term after that. Anyway, lower leg. Uh, let's see. We've got... Seems pretty good. I guess that'll do. I was thinking the proportion, like this felt a little long or this felt long, but I don't know, actually, I think it's about, about right. Do we have any more questions? Yes. I have oh. about three swarms. That's good. There is one question here that says, when doing quick sketch, what is the best way to think about combining gesture, structure, rendering? Or is that too much? Okay, so they're asking about quick sketch and how, did you say how or when? What is the best way to think about combining oh, okay. gesture, structure, rendering? So what's the best way to think about combining gesture, structure, and rendering in quick sketch? Or is that too much? No, it's not too much. It's hard. It's, it's certainly an advanced version of Quick Sketch, but that's that should be your goal. That's you know that should be what you want to work your way up to, definitely. Um, yeah, Quick Sketch is whatever you want it to be. Really, that's really what it comes down to. Like as a student, I took a lot of Quick Sketch classes. I'm not. I mean, I'm I'm fine at it now, right? But it was not my strong area. I'm not like a fast person. I'm not really a fast thinker. I don't move very fast. So for me, Quick Sketch was hard. Olivia's like laughing at me right now. She's like, yeah, you're slow. Um, yeah, so I had a really hard time with Quick Sketch. I got to the point after taking it for like a few years that I could kind of do it. But um, yeah, what I learned was that you don't have to try to do what you see the instructor do, right? Because obviously I went to Watts, so I was watching like some of the best Quick Sketch artists in the world doing a demo. And then I, I'd sit down and try and do what they do. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm really bad at this. This is horrible. You know, and eventually I realized, like, wait a minute, I don't have to do what I see them do necessarily. What I need to do is watch what they do just in the first, like, minute, or just watch how they start it, right? How they just put the gesture down really fast and try and just get the proportions quick. How are they doing that? And then I would spend all my time focused on that. And I did this in the regular classes, too, not just quick sketch. But, like, the, even, like, a 25-minute demo is basically a quick sketch. Um... You know, so they would be doing these full value demos in like 25 minutes or in five minutes or, and I just kind of like said, okay, I'm going to focus on what they do in the first few minutes. And then I would spend the entire class just working on that, just working on gesture, just working on proportion, you know, and then once I kind of started getting the hang of that, then I sort of added the next step and, and worked my way up from there, just kind of gradually, little by little. And that was really my method. But yeah, your goal should be to be able to do all those things, but it's not going to happen right away, I guess is my point. And you need kind of like a strategic approach to being able to do that. And that was mine. That was kind of what I came up with was not worrying about it so much and not trying to do all of it at once, but doing as much as I could and focusing more on, is my drawing accurate? Is it proportionally correct? Is the anatomy correct? 
Uh, does it look cool? What's the line quality like? What's, you know, what does it look like? And once it starts kind of looking okay, then you move on to the next step and you're like, well, okay, now I can knock out a solid gesture with some structure in five minutes. That's cool. Uh, now let's see if we can speed it up and start trying to figure out how to do that a little bit faster and have time to do some mapping. And then eventually, eventually what happens is you start combining steps and you start realizing like, oh, I can put a really simple gesture down and then I can do my structure and my anatomy and my mapping and even a little bit of tone, basically all at once, right? Once you do it long enough. And that's kind of where you want to get to. But uh, it's, you know, it's not easy to get to that point. It just takes practice, though. So. so hopefully that answers your question. But yeah, you should be able to do all of it, but it's, it's just hard and takes a long time. This right here, this is rectus femoris, right? You know, like that middle muscle in the quads. And then we have a little bit of vastus medialis here that we can see. You know, the sartorius is probably running down basically right along here, maybe. He's got his leg twisted away from us, just kind of like a little bit. We're seeing a little bit of the glute. Cutting in just a little bit, which is kind of crazy because the other one seems like it's way up here. That's kind of what I'm seeing in the reference. I think part of that might be the crazy shape I put here that's causing that. Well, I don't know. We'll try this and see how it looks. All right, so this kind of comes in and then we hit the hamstring. Just kind of basically just coming out this way. Cutting back in this way. And then now is where you really got to know your anatomy, right? Because the hamstring splits into, well, it's, it's different muscles, right? You have like a different hamstring muscle on each side of the back of the leg. Uh, on the inside, we would have like semi-tendinosis and then semi-membranosis, I think, underneath it. It could be layered the other way. Sometimes I get those mixed up. Uh, but basically, those turn into tendon and then they run right in through here along with the sartorius. Like the sartorius comes down and then we get the tendon from the hamstring coming down and they all kind of merge into a big common tendon right about in here. You know, so we can even find like, say here's our sartorius, you know, that's gonna be wrapping down around that way. Our hamstring, right, is sitting up in here. This is turning into tendon, coming down and kind of connecting And becoming like a common tendon with this and then this sort of comes around and sort of grips the tibia and sort of like comes around and grabs onto the tibia like that this is a tough angle this inside of the leg angle you know and then the adductors are going to be coming down here in the middle and then we're seeing a little bit of the glute i think kind of like that maybe just a little bit Tough angle, very tough. But then we get the uh, the calf coming out from behind here, right? It's kind of squeezing up into here and going up. And of course, gastrocnemius, right, is a part of the calf I'm talking about. And it's going up and connecting to the the femur, right? The head of the femur, which is like way up here so it's actually going like way up in there and then popping out about here. And then we're seeing gastrocnemius kind of coming out this way and maybe doing this. And then we get the soleus, which sits underneath the gastrocnemius coming down here. And then that kind of swings out into the heel. All right, so you can see like knowing that anatomy, it's pretty important. I mean, I know I've had a lot of students, and as a student, I even resisted for a long time studying anatomy. And I would recommend not, not doing that. I would recommend studying it, because it is incredibly important. It's the kind of thing where you don't realize how important it is until uh, you have that knowledge and start being able to use it. And then you're like, oh, I see, we actually really do need this. It's pretty critical. And it's not to say that you can't do a good drawing without 
knowing literally every piece of anatomy. But your ability to design things, right? And again, it depends on what you want your drawing to look like because there's a lot of, um, I don't know, a lot of artwork that's based more on copying reference, right? But you can see what I have here is not a copy of the reference, right? Like I'm referencing the pose, right? Because I, I want to learn about how this pose works. I'm referencing, um, I'm basically using it for like proportional things and, and that's about it, right? Like if you look at the contours that I put on here, they don't really match the reference at all. I don't know. Maybe we can put the reference on again. I won't say anything while the reference is on because it's going to cut my mic off. But you can look at it for a second. Yeah. Get that reference photo. It was up. What? You got cut off there. Oh. Okay, say what you're going to say. Oh, okay. Um, basically, just look at this for a second and then look at the reference photo and you'll see that they don't match. That's cool. Um, yeah, so you can see I'm basically redesigning and simplifying a lot of things and clarifying things and uh, making it look like a drawing really is my goal. Like there's, there's a lot of ways, like when I was in high school, right, they showed us, they were like, here's how you draw, you know, and they had us take a photo and put like a grid over it. And then we put a grid on our paper. And then with graphite, we like really carefully rendered each little square of the grid. And I ended up with like this, like photo real drawing. I think it was of Kurt Cobain at the time. I think I had like a Kurt Cobain photo. I don't know where I found it. High school was a long time ago for me. And, uh, yeah, it was really cool. I was like, oh, this is awesome. You know, but what I realized after a while was that doesn't translate into like a cool comic book drawing or something like that. Like it's a totally different mindset, you know? And so that was where I got more focused on this kind of stuff and trying to make that jump between like kind of being able to invent things versus, you know, just copy reference. And so that's kind of our goal is yeah, we're using reference, but we're also inventing a figure, right? Like this is more or less an invented figure. And I just based it off of the pose that I'm seeing and a couple little key measurements maybe. And uh, yeah, I don't wanna make it sound like invention is super easy. Like once you learn how to do this, like, but it's a lot easier. I'll say that it's much more possible than it is. Uh, without having studied this kind of stuff. I don't know why I just got focused on this hand real quick. Anyway, what time is it? It's been about an hour. I guess I can put some mapping or something on here. bit of tricep or what's just a, a subtle little tricep indication hopefully that looks pretty good anyway this is more or less it this is what I wanted to show demo wise and maybe let us know you can message us on Instagram or in YouTube like in the video and tell us like what type of stuff you'd like to see in a live stream. You know, do you want more like this kind of stuff? Like where I just spent a bunch of time talking about construction, rendering, that sort of thing? Or do you want, well, not rendering, but construction, anatomy, basic shapes, you know, all that. Or do you want more like uh, rendered type stuff? I'm trying to get a hairline on here. So we can separate out the shape of the face. Um, I'm trying to put hair on there is my goal. I want a hair shape. So it is not hairless. There's hair. I should probably zoom in and look at it a little bit. Basically comes almost straight up here. Back a bit. Comes 
back up this way. It's cool, but it feels big, right? If we look at the whole thing, Say that head feels a little big considering that it's the whole torso is leaned away from us right like that doesn't seem quite right so i'm going to shrink that head shape just a little bit right now let's see if i can do this pull this jaw in a little the hairline down a little bit notice there's not a big difference right like I just moved that like a quarter inch or less but in drawing that's a huge amount right that's part of what makes drawing so hard is it really comes down to like millimeters like between something looking right and something not looking right and that's the level that we have to like develop our ability to judge proportion and distance and all that stuff. It's got to come to a point of being really, really accurate, like literally within millimeters. So I shrunk the face a bit. That feels better. Let's shrink the hair a little bit. So we're seeing a little bit of the ear over here. Just a little tiny bit of ear. Over on that side. Okay, so we shrunk the face a bit. Shrunk the hair just a little bit. But again, notice it's not like I made like a huge, huge change. It was subtle. I think it's one that's going to help. Let's look at it again. Let's look at the whole thing here. That feels a little better. Feels a little more proportional. Maybe still a little bit big, possibly. I'm going to leave it. I think it's fine. I think it gets the point across at least. All right, let's see if we can find... thirds here. All right, so we break the head down into thirds, but not everybody's head fits those thirds perfectly, and I've drawn him a lot of times, so I know just automatically, right off the bat, that the bottom third, whenever you draw a reed, is going to be a little bit bigger than the top two. Could use a little more chin out of here though. One more chin, pull this down just a little bit. All right, so we should have this space equal to that space. That's not that close. And this space a little bit bigger. I'm gonna go with it. I think it looks good enough. We can come in and kind of start finding like where the little glabella shape is going to sit. I guess his head is turned a bit, so we could actually use our three quarter ish. Type connection here. Right, 
right nose sweeps down this direction. It's going to sit right down here. Put our nostril. Put our nostril over on this side. Creating some uh, eye socket shapes real quick here. Right, so that kind of starts showing us where those eyes are going to sit. Basically right up in there. You know, and then we take the bottom third, break it into thirds. All right, measure again, make sure it's close. Yeah, not bad. It's pretty good. Two cylinders going to project forward a little bit. Same with the chin. That was maybe a little bit extreme, but mouth is basically sitting out here. Chin down here. So it looked like him, uh, honestly, I squished his face a little bit. Also, part of what's going on is we have a consistent angle for all our features here, but notice what doesn't fit that angle is our hairline. That's a little bit off. So we have to decide, do we want to bring this part up a little bit? Do we want to bring this part down a little bit? I'm going to say we bring this part down. Maybe. We can bring it back up. Just try it. We'll just see what works. Let's see if that matches a little bit better. Does this angle match that angle? Yeah. Closer, definitely. Pull this neck in a little bit. So I remember I adjusted the head and moved the jaw, but then I left the neck in the same place. So now his neck looks kind of like too wide compared to his head. So you can kind of pull that back in a little bit. Don't need to get into ear stuff right now. Anyway, this is pretty much it. I think this is a good place to stop. Unless there's more questions. There's one more and one response. Okay, we've got a question and a response. So the responses to the question earlier about footstep. Yeah. And they just said that they said, yeah, some rendering would be great. I tend not to be patient and go to too dark too early mm. too dark too early with rendering i can relate to that believe me i have that problem or had that i still do have that problem occasionally uh fortunately you know you get, you get after, over it after a while um yeah i can relate as a student that happened to me literally every drawing for like a few years probably is i went too dark too fast 
it's part of it is a dexterity thing and just learn, developing the ability to you know control the amount of pressure you're putting on the pencil and that kind of thing and then part of it is training your eye and brain to recognize those values correctly you know because it's it's very misleading there's a lot of ways that our eye plays tricks on us you know and it has to do with contrast a little bit um, so like if you're looking at something and it's like the darkest thing say like we just have a blank page and we put a value on there it's going to look a lot darker than it actually is and the reason for that is because it's right next to the bright white paper you know and so our eye for whatever reason will perceive that as being really dark when in reality it's not as dark as it actually seems you know and vice versa like things can seem brighter than they actually are and there's all sorts of like weird tricks that our brain and eye play on us while we're uh, you know figuring this stuff out and it takes a long time to overcome those and what it took for me was you know having an instructor look at my drawings and be like no that's too dark that's too light and uh, you know eventually kind of start piecing it together and figuring out you know, you basically recalibrate your own brain is really what it comes down to in your eye. And uh, you start recognizing. In fact, one of the things that really helped me with that was what I was just showing here. Right. So uh, this probably got a little bit dark. But again, part of that is because this shadow, I think, could actually be even darker. If we go in here and darken this a little bit, it has this weird effect where suddenly it makes this seem a little bit brighter because this got darker. You know, we can like adjust things. But what I was getting at is this right here where I actually draw the value scale. This really helped me like kind of recalibrate my eye and brain. I mean, aside from just feedback from instructors, I started doing this, right? And actually drawing out a value scale on my paper up in the corner. I mean, they had one in, in, hanging up in the room that you could look at, but for some reason that didn't help me much. I had to literally draw it right next to my drawing and then organize it, like organize my value scale. And that's exactly what I was talking about in this demo specifically was like, here's our value scale. We need to pick what are our shadows, what are our values in the light? What are our values in the shadow? Uh, what is the local value of the hair, right? Because he has really dark hair. Uh, and then start figuring out how to apply those values to your drawing, right? Like if these are our shadow values, this is going to be basically our lightest shadow value, right? Because these three are light, these three are shadow. Our lightest shadow value is going to be our reflected light value is really what it is. And so when we fill everything in into the two value stage, it has to be that value. Now, this can change, right? Depending on whether you want like a more high key, low key type drawing, uh, you can have more values in the shadow, you can have more values in the light and less in the shadow. Like you can arrange this value scale however you want, but it has to be consistent. And for some reason, having that value scale and this little breakdown right next to my drawing gave me something to like compare each thing to. And as soon as it started to get too dark, I could look over here and say, wait a minute, I'm starting to get too dark because I'm not matching my value scale and it has to match that perfectly. There has to be that level of organization in your values and in your rendering. And if it's not there, things fall apart really fast. And that's no fun. It's something I experienced for many years and it gets better, but you know, you gotta draw a lot of bad drawings, unfortunately. Yeah. There's another question. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Next question is, what's the difference between studies and renders or studies and exercises? Thank you. So somebody asked what the difference is between studies and renders and studies and exercises. I would say that there is no difference. I mean, the term rendering, like in terms of a render, rendering is this part of the drawing, right? Like this would be, this would be like your, you know, gesture and structure and some anatomy, uh, this would be considered like construction, basically, right? Like this is like our construction. And then the next phase after this would be considered rendering. But I don't know, like the school I went to and the way they teach it and the way I do it now, there's kind of almost like an extra stage in there, which would be like shadow mapping. But you don't have to do that. It's not like completely necessary. You can do a nice drawing without it. But basically, this would be the first stage. 
And then rendering would be bringing it up to more like this, right? Like this level of finish. You know, so rendering is like a finishing thing where you're going in and, and actually uh, creating those like shapes and values and adjusting the edges and doing that all in a way that hopefully comes together into like a cohesive whole, you know? Uh, so that would be rendering. But you can render, you, know, you have to practice rendering. So like you can do all of that as a study. To me, a study and an exercise would be the same thing. It's just two words that mean more or less the same thing. Um, you know, like you could do a specific type of study as an exercise, I guess, maybe. I guess they are a little bit different. But I don't think how to explain it, you know. Like you could say I'm going to do a study of like... A master study right is a good example where you're going to like recreate a rock well and try and figure out how to render a rock well painting in charcoal or something you know that would be uh, a master study but this is kind of a study as well in a way it's also an exercise it's just practice it's all just practice but studies and exercises i mean we're just talking about practice basically it's the difference between drawing something to get better at drawing versus drawing something because you're getting paid to draw something, you know, is kind of the, the two things. I don't know. I don't know if that explanation helped or not. But that would be my answer. Is there, yeah, exercises and studies? Similar. Not exactly the same, but very similar. I made this ear a little bit too small. Anyway, that's pretty much it. So if there's no more questions, we can stop or I can keep asking more stuff. Yeah. Let's see. The first, okay, so there was one more comment yeah. that said the front knee, please. I'm not sure what that means exactly. The front knee? Please. Please. What, can I see your drawing again? That looks Did like this. Did you not do the front knee? I mean, I didn't put much detail in the front knee. Uh, I could add more. Um, can I show the reference really quick? Yeah, you can show the Let's reference. Look at yeah. the reference. Here's a reference. So, as you can see, I did not put a lot of detail in the knee. Partly because I was mostly focused on the big forms of the knee, right? And yeah, it depends on how far we want to take it, right? Like, if I were to just bring this drawing up to more of a finish... I wouldn't go in there and figure out every single aspect of this knee. What I would do is create a shadow pattern. And that shadow pattern would be based off of the anatomy of the knee. Right? So you have to know that anatomy really well. Um, what, I mean, if we want to get really technical, right? Well, you've got the tibia up in here. right? Fibula back around here. But it's, again, it's all about these basic shapes. Notice what I just drew for the top of the tibia is just a box, right? I just drew a little tiny box right there real quick. The femur, head of the femur is like up here. Right? Head of the femur is going to be like I don't know, looking something like that. Right, which means our kneecap is sitting probably right out in here, right in front of these two. Right, probably right out there. And then you have to figure out, okay, how do we layer all the anatomy on top of it? Honestly, it would take a while to explain. I don't think I want to take it much farther than this. Certainly in the leg anatomy class, we go way into that. I mean, we spend a lot of time talking about that kind of thing. But this bone is essentially right in here, right? So remember, this is the great trochanter. And so, make sure I'm doing this right. I'm looking at the skeleton real quick. Right, the rest of the bone It's like right in here. Like we can actually figure out where that femur goes. 
just based entirely off of that structure that we put down. You know, and so we can kind of see that femur sitting up in here. How it connects, right? The tibia. Sitting up in here, we get the tibial tuberosity, right? Which is basically that little bump on the tibia. You can feel it on the front of your knee where the, the tendon from the kneecap comes down and connects to this little bump on the front of your tibia. Right, and then the kneecap itself is sitting out in front here. It's literally just sitting out this way. Try to give it some three dimensionalness. Right, that tendon kind of drop down and connect to that bump. about in there. This is getting a lot of overlapping stuff, so it's looking confusing. I'm going to clean it up a little bit just so we can kind of see everything that connects together, right? And then from there we have a bunch of muscles, you know, so we have rectus femoris coming up and around and then the tendon from rectus femoris wrapping around to the knee. And then we see some of the medialis off to the side here, kind of popping out here and wrapping around and disappearing right under here. And then we get tibia sticking out from there. Ah, don't like that, I went the wrong way. Right, and then we have the lateralis sitting up on here, right? And then we get like the IT band, tendon from here, the IT band, wrapping down, connecting to in here. But I don't know, this is gonna get really confusing, right? Because I didn't intend this to be like a purely anatomy drawing. So we're gonna get like a million things overlapping, but I think you get the idea how we can keep breaking it down Right, but ultimately we need to know that stuff so well that we can come in here and design it out this way and just focus on these basic shapes and making sure that they're reading properly. You know, and it all conforms to that underlying structure right there of, you know, the bones, the femur, the tibia, fibula, it all sits up in there. Anyway, hopefully that's kind of what you're asking about. Uh, again, there's a lot more, like if we took the time, I don't have time now because it takes me a while to do it, but we could go in there and find every single muscle Right, we would have the medialis out here, vastus medialis, rectus femoris poking out up top, vastus lateralis on the side. We would get the, um, uh, what is that, gluteus medius and gluteus maximus connecting into, oh, and tensor fascia lata, which is also up in here, kind of, kind of wrapping around this way, getting all bunched up. Right, that all turns into IT band Kind of wrapping around this way and connecting to the tibia right in there. But again, like we wouldn't want to draw all that necessarily if we were going to take this up to more like a rendered type finish. If we wanted to just do an anatomy drawing, then yeah, then you draw all this stuff. But if, to have this much line work underneath your rendering isn't going to look super great probably. Cool. Anyway, 
Any more? There's one more, well, kind of a comment. Yeah. So this is from David Rodriguez. He says, I think I'm good with proportions, but rendering I just can't yet. I wanted to mention that on our website, if you go to the free sample lesson or yeah. the sample lesson page, yeah. there's the shadow mapping demo for free. So if oh, you yeah. wanted to check out the shadow mapping demo there, that's a really good place to start. It's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, whoever wrote that they're good with proportion, but not rendering, you can go check out the sample page on our website. And we have like a free demo you can watch. It's all about shadow mapping and edges and that kind of stuff. It's not like a full rendering demo, but it's a full demo that it's focused on shadow mapping. It should probably be helpful. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. What's that say? This is so good. Oh, the foot abstraction reminded me of Bridgman abstraction for the foot. That's cool. Bridgman draws some cool feet. And uh, you know what's weird is Hogarth is really good for hands and feet even though everything else he draws is a little bit odd. I should be careful. A lot of people like Hogarth. Uh, but yeah, it's cool. I'm glad you like the foot. I'm teaching a foot class in a couple terms. Next term is feet, hands. Yeah, next term is hands. The, person, the whole thing. The person that was asking about the knee. Yeah. They said hello from Italy, and they said salute oh. from Italy. Hello from Italy. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, that's the kind of thing you were thinking of with the knee. I don't really want to draw like all the anatomy right now, but you should know it well enough that you could build it up from the inside out, right, and figure out where those bones sit and layer all the muscle on top, and have it turn into a leg, like a cool-looking leg, hopefully. And then you should be able to do the opposite, right? Is just start, kind of like I was doing here, start with just simple cylindrical boxy type shapes and then build the anatomy into it, you know, and go the other way. I kind of need to be able to do both a little bit. Not liking that kneecap for some reason. Anyway, I think we can stop. Oh, Hogarth is also very good for feet. Yeah, he's good for hands and feet. A lot of the heads that he draws look like they're melting or something. I don't know. I, I won't say mean things about Hogarth. He's got some good stuff. Cool. Anyway, I think we're done. This is the end. Thank you for watching. I appreciate it. And we're planning to do this every, what's today, Wednesday? Every Wednesday. So if you want to come back and watch more, it's 6 p.m. on Wednesday, or if you're somewhere else in the world, it's not 6 p.m. But if you're on the West Coast of the United States of America, it's at 6 p.m. Yeah. Pacific time. Pacific time, specifically, if you want to get very specific about the time. Yeah, 6 p.m. Pacific. Yeah, I'll see you guys next